Eckler, question for Doctor. Yeah. This isn't actually related to <coughs> the material, but this was written back in like 1611. So uh, around those. 50? 50, 51? 50 around those times. I, did, nobody really read back then, correct? Um, this isn't exactly a bestseller popular work for the masses. This oh. is a work for intellectuals. I mean, he's writing for uh, politicians isn't exactly right, but... That was mostly what I was asking. Yeah, like, yeah. Who was he writing to? Because I knew this wasn't going to get out to the general masses too easily. Um, so, um, he was writing for the elite. I mean, he's writing for the rulers of society. Um, yeah, so. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Is he completely uh, denying the intrinsic value of this whole? It does seem that way, but then he brings objectivity to the He denies intrinsic value as a ground level values about what's good or bad, what's valuable or disvaluable in the world. And from a foundation of subjectivity about value, when I say values, I mean you should be thinking maybe something like states of affairs of the world. He's, he's absolutely insistent that there is no state of, of affairs of the world that's intrinsically better than any other. States of affairs of the world, or ends, are made valuable simply by the fact of somebody's desire. Without those desires, no state of affairs of the world is any better than any other. So it doesn't even consider peace to be intrinsically valuable. It's not intrinsically valuable. It is, in fact, valuable for each of us, or rationally valuable, because even if we don't directly value it, it's instrumentally valuable, objectively speaking, for what we happen to desire. Um, from this subjective basis, he wants to construct an objective account of how we rationally, really, <coughs> should uh, impose more constraints on ourselves. It is objectively rational for us to do that. Okay, a little bit more vocabulary. A little bit more vocabulary. Um, uh, sorry. Um, look at. Um, where he points out that some rights, so when we say rights here, we may be a way to talk about it is some parts of the right of nature, we all have this unlimited right, but some parts of it, some rights that we have as part of the right of nature, he says, um, he doesn't use this word, but I will, um, are inalienable. So some parts of our right of nature cannot be transferred, cannot be renounced. So he says, um, a man, he says, cannot lay down the right of resisting other people that assault him by force to take away his life. So here's an example of a right that is inalienable, right to self-defense, from immediate physical attack. Okay, so I'll come back to give a theory of why that might be um, in a minute. But the point is that, remember, the second law of nature tells us that on the condition that other people are willing to do so, and to the extent that they're willing to do so, we need to, we should give up our right of nature. Also, on the condition that other people are willing to do so. Now, to the extent that they are able to do so, they can't give up certain inalienable parts of the right of nature. And we can't either. 
But that's okay, we still retain the kind of symmetry here, where everybody is giving up their right of nature to the greatest extent that they can. All of the parts of the right of nature which they can give up, they do give up on the condition that other people do the same. And I want to say again that Hobbes' claim here is not that it would be irrational to give up these rights. The claim here is that we cannot, that uh, an attempt to do so, uh, an attempt to renounce this right or to transfer this right doesn't actually do that. Okay, so um, quickly here's the vocabulary that we needed. Contract is a mutual transference of rights. So I give up some right on the condition that you give up that some right to me. Uh, and vice versa, you're giving up the right as conditional and not giving up. A covenant is a contract, a specific kind of contract. A covenant is a contract regarding some future act. So we each promise to give up, uh, sorry, each, we each promise to do something for the other in the future. There's a mutual transference of rights regarding some action, let's say, in the future. And lastly, a free gift is just a one-sided transfer. Where somebody <laughs> receives somebody else's right without giving up anything. Okay, so and now I can say that an inalienable right is one that we cannot transfer. And so if we, for example, make a contract where one person agrees to give up a right that is inalienable, well, you know, we take it all out and we sign on the dotted line, and maybe it looks as though we've mutually transferred our rights, but we haven't because that attempt misfires, so to speak. It does not actually succeed in transferring that right. So I'll use the word invalid. That contract is invalid. It didn't actually do what it was trying to do because there was an inalienable. Okay, let's go. Okay, so our next question is, what invalidates a covenant? Or what invalidates a contract? And here Hobbes gives um, an explanation of, uh, I want to say one thing, or maybe one important main thing, that invalidates a covenant. So invalidate means that we have an attempt to transfer rights that somehow fails. We each actually retain the rights that we were trying to transfer. This is paragraph 18, the bottom of 84. It says, it says this, if a covenant be made wherein neither of the parties perform presently, covenant which each party agrees to do something in the future, but rather trust one another, he says in the condition of mere nature, which remember is a condition of war of every man against every man, he says, under any, upon any reasonable suspicion, under reasonable suspicion means about whether the other party is going to comply or not. If there's a reasonable suspicion, if the contract, the covenant, is void. But if there is, okay, so stop there. Uh, so, in the state of nature, we make an agreement. In the state of nature, we make an agreement. We think to ourselves, I think to myself, I would better be able to satisfy my desires if I could get you to help me with my harvest this fall. And you think to yourself, you will do better in terms of satisfying your desires if you get me to help you with your harvest in the fall. And so in the spring, we type out our agreement and sign it. I give up my right to do what I want when your harvest is due on the condition that you 
help me when mine. And same the other way for you. Right? So we transfer our rights to do what we want in this way to the other on the condition that, and this will be, we think, mutually advantageous. We're each going to do better in terms of our own satisfaction of our desires by cooperating. Okay, and now it comes time for me to help you. Your harvest is ready before mine. And I think to myself, huh, if I help you, you will have your harvest. Next week or next month, it'll be time for you to help me with my harvest. And I think to myself, in the state of nature, why do I think you're actually going to help? You're, you've already got the benefit from my helping you with your harvest. Why, what kind of assurance do I have that you are going to help me then? So Hobbes is asking, would I have a reasonable suspicion about your non-compliance? And the answer in the state of nature is yes. I'm going to have a reasonable suspicion about whether you will comply. And therefore, do I have an obligation now to help you? No. That covenant is void. That covenant is invalid. So what looked like a way of transferring rights for mutual advantage while we were still in the state of nature failed. It failed because a covenant in which there's a reasonable suspicion about whether the other party is going to comply is invalid. It doesn't put a people under obligation. And and I've got to be a little bit careful here, but more or less, always in the state of nature, there's a reasonable suspicion about whether the other party is going to do that. There's going to be an important exception. Maybe more than one. But basically, that's Hobbes' view. No valid covenants in the state of nature, maybe almost no valid covenants in the state of nature. Um, and and therefore, no transfer of right of nature in the state of nature, no successful transfer. And therefore, no injustice in the state of nature, no violation of our covenant, of our valid covenants. In the state of nature, we retain our full right of nature. Um, okay, last point. Um, why then does Hobbes think that uh, the right to self-defense is inalienable. The tools are right here. So I make a, an agreement in which I promise you that I will not defend myself if you attack me physically. So that's the agreement. I try to transfer or renounce that right. Is that a valid agreement? Is that an agreement that's valid now? What invalidates a covenant? Suspicion. Reasonable suspicion. So do you have reasonable suspicion about my compliance with that? Hobbes' claim is yes. That more or less the way human beings are, they're always going to defend themselves when attacked physically. And so any agreement in which you renounce that right is not going to be something that anybody can count on. And therefore it's in there. So we'll pick up here um, next time. Uh, I said, enter chapter 17 by today. We won't get past that for Wednesday, so read through 110 if you have time. Here are two handouts. Pick up both of these on the next